All right, welcome to Control System Cybersecurity. We're going to discuss why is cybersecurity important, uh, a little bit about the cyber arms race specifically in this space, some recent research that's taken place with PLCs and uh, program automation controllers, and uh, of course what we can do to actually protect ourselves. Um, reality is with cybersecurity, specifically in control system space, things have changed pretty dramatically, at least from the threat and exploit categories um, on the internet, where now there are publicly accessible exploits available for different types of controllers, either through the exploit DB or Metasploit or other online repositories that you have to go to our researcher's website or some location to be able to gain access to that information. Um, the common type of, of risk that we're going to have, of course, is just leading to production disruption, of course, then leading to loss of revenue. I mean, that's, that's the risk that you have, the most simplest of risk. I mean, that's very costly, absolutely, and can absolutely make a, a company fail. Uh, but the more disastrous risk is where we lead to that potential loss of life. Again, it's not personal identifiable information that we're as concerned of. In this space with control systems, we're concerned about the potential loss of life, or even the cataclysmic situation is where we have some kind of series of cyber assets within multiple control systems throughout a geographic or a larger area that are impacted simultaneously that could impact a nation state or some kind of productivity associated uh, with a region, something that maybe is in critical employment for a region. That would be the worst case scenario. So what do we look at from a, a cyber arms space, arms race with control systems? You know, as time has gone on, you know, the, the most likely types of attacks, again, are the more trivial ones that we're dealing with. Uh, they include, you know, simple eavesdropping on conversations. They include theft of intellectual property. They include theft of service. You know, something where uh, they also, are, or the more simple ones, are just denial of service conditions. It's typically much easier to deny somebody access to an asset or make the asset less valuable to the owner than to actually take over the asset and make it be more valuable to the attacker. That's a much more difficult situation, as well as even leads to it being much easier to identify who the attacker is, because you have to have constant communication with this asset that you're owning. Uh, so then the, the response, hopefully you're able to find out who it is. As time has continued, though, we've moved to even where we now have with Stuxnet, you could look at it as almost like the rootkit for a Siemens controller as it would propagate it around throughout the environment. Um, to where we now even have protocol attacks being looked at where we're able to see, hey, generate this um, Allen Bradley PCCC communication to uh, um, a SIP communicating device, a common industrial protocol communicating device, and it can crash the CPU. Uh, protocol analysis from a vulnerable PLC point of view, there has been quite a bit performed, but there's not a lot of public information that's out there. A lot of it has been maintained as private. What has been publicly announced has happened, the big events have been in 2008 and 2011 and here early in, in 2012. The one in 2008 didn't get a lot of fanfare, uh, but it's one that was very important in Black Hat 2008 when Jason Larson gave a presentation entitled Breakage. Uh, nobody has really gone to that, that level of detail in that presentation since that time. Uh, where it discussed what about, you know, the example being what if you could look at the logic of an environment, find specifically the master stop conditions that are there, and then look at how you can create those conditions. But if you can find out, hey, what if these, it, it runs three pumps, only one's supposed to be active at a given time, what if we run all three at the same time? What if we can find a way to do that? What if we can find a way to reprogram the environment to support that? You know, what if we can, in a combination standpoint, address the logic change in and has also modified some of the safety systems that are in place. Um, so you know, that's one of many examples that you get into. Another one could just be you know, the, the speed, right, the RPM of a motor. What if we could have it exceed its thresholds? What if we can then simultaneously, again, modify the safety system and the control system? Uh, so that was back in 2008 that that was discussed. I highly recommend you take a look at that presentation there at Black Hat uh, by Jason Larson entitled Breakage. In mid-2011 at Black Hat once again, uh, Dylan Bairdsford released a presentation focusing on uh, Siemens uh, S7 controller and some of the exploits that you could go after against it in rewriting the ladder logic of that controller as well as a hard-coded username and password that was within the controller and at the same time even some uh, 
what was I believe some dancing monkey web pages that were actually on the controller itself. Um, that moves us up to earlier in 2012 when Digital Bond and Project Basecamp came out with, you know, it was, it was a, several researchers worked together and they analyzed controllers from Alan Bradley, from Schneider Electric, from GE, from SEL, uh, and from Koyo, and they then put in a matrix showing you whether it was firmware, backdoors, or fuzzing, or web vulnerabilities, which of the vendors had what type of vulnerabilities, and nobody came out successful in this, really. Uh, the hope was, the success story would be that this would be labeled, uh, and, and per uh, Digital Bonds uh, speaker themselves, be labeled a fire sheep moment, specifically in industrial control system space. And if you're not familiar with what fire sheep is, that's a uh, attack program specifically targeting um, webbed HTML-based communications, and it's a little plug-in that works inside Firefox. But nonetheless, it still seems to be that it wasn't necessarily that fire sheep moment. We still need a lot more to be addressed in this space. Uh, these vulnerabilities are common from a protocol perspective. The hardware itself does need to be a bit more ruggedized in being able to accept multiple communications without uh, falling over. Or, again, you just realize that that's how it's going to be and you build the right security uh, program around the assets that are vulnerable to those types of attacks. And that's exactly what we're going to get into here. Because you have to run your facility, you have to run your environment. You don't have a choice to say, okay, well fine, we're just vulnerable, we'll let it go. As long as you're able to get the budget associated with what you need in your environment, then you can put in the right protective back doors. The question is, can you actually develop the business case to then say what kind of budget you need to then put in the right security controls? So that's where we get into, you know, what can we actually do to protect ourselves? And the first thing you have to do is actually identify your cyber assets. Identify what is connected within your environment. And then from there, identify your most critical ones. What are, the, what are the ones that are necessary for emergency and operating conditions that actually provide real-time or near real-time control in the environment? Those are the ones that you need to protect first. And then how do they communicate with each other? Who are they communicating with and how do they communicate with each other? Your control system environment should be very narrow, should be very focused, should be much smaller to deal with than your, than your actual uh, business networks that, uh, traditionally where it's just complete chaos and trying to figure out how things are configured and controlled. So now you can use tools to analyze communication patterns such as Sophia or NetFlow or Wireshark or Snort or other, other things that can watch communication patterns and then find out how these devices are talking to each other, baseline that, and then be able to put in controls to analyze for differences in the future, which of course may be malicious attackers. Identify all the information that's used to operate and maintain them, and of course also the people that are going to be using them. All of that is part of the process, and it's people, process, technology that we have to deal with securing cyber, operationally, and physically. Uh, next step after you've done that is you have to perform that combined engineering, physical security, and cyber security analysis. That's very important. Engineering, physical security, and cybersecurity analysis. You need everybody to come together. You need to somehow jump over some of those either thin walls or big walls of silos between some of the individual departments that have happened over time and make sure that everybody can actually find the answer for how you need to protect these environments physically, operationally, and cyber-wise. Because it is that combined aspect. And you're gonna be able to look at it and say, you know what, this physical asset, the way that it's actually been deployed, there are limitations that this water pump can be operated in a way that could blow that valve. Then all of a sudden, if that's the case, then you need to think about it, well, cyber-wise, we could try to protect it, but maybe we need to re-engineer as well to solve this problem. That's why it requires the combined approach. Maybe a physical security control needs to be put in place around the PLC because it's not remotely accessible, but it could be physically accessible, and then we could actually have a, an alarm that happens any time the enclosure is opened. I mean, that's a very common solution that's been put in place in a lot of different facilities, but you have to operate together and collectively if you're going to find that answer. Then once you identify the types of controls you need to put in place, enable them. Enable the protective controls, monitor them for their effectiveness, monitor them for how they're actually operating so you can get the results from your security controls, and then be able to respond if something happened that's with malicious intent or maybe even not malicious intent, you have to go investigate to see why something has even happened. At the same time, the best thing you can do is with all of those requirements is also identify a way where you can actually increase performance, increase productivity, have a better environment, not just from a security perspective, but also reduce some of your costs. And if you can, you know, that's the, that really is the magic. If you can somehow make uh, 
security, physical cyber and operational security, uh, a profit center in your organization where you can actually reduce some of your costs at the same time. That's really magical too.